afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're it off. So I'm Katrina Charles, I'm one of the um, chairs of the Office of Water Network. So thanks for, yeah, thanks for joining us today, today for this talk. Um, we're really excited to have a chance to showcase um, one of the, the team from the Water Network leadership team, but also from the Department of Ge Geography. So Dr. Kevin Gretsch is our course director for the Water Science Policy Management Master's course. Um, and he's been doing some, he does some amazing work. I think it's really important that we, uh, our students also recognize our course directors, our academics in their own right, and value their research, not just the huge amount of effort they put in to support our, our master's courses. Um, Unfortunately, Jessica could not be here with us today. She's unfortunately unwell, so Kevin's going to take the whole whole session today. Um, and I'm sure he'll share more of um, how you can find out more about Jessica's work more broadly and other other bits as he as he goes through as well. So yes, yeah, very warm welcome to Kevin. I'm really really looking forward to the talk. Yeah, thank thank you, Katrina. Um, yeah, Jessica sent her apologies, but um, yeah, long COVID is yeah, so I really don't wish it upon anyone. Um, but um, she's available like, for questions. Uh, I am confident with most of the parts because she's a historian and obviously she has much deeper knowledge about some of the issues, but I try my best um, to, to make up for it. Um, yeah, so, so this is a collaboration between myself and Jessica, who is, as I said, a, a, um, a historian and by training, and she's interested in historical like stereotypes and historical uh, stereotype like research. Um, and that, that is, of course, like very closely linked to identities. Uh, and you will see that this will pop up quite frequently. Um, so here's um, what I'm going to <laughs> here's what I'm going to do. Um, well, all of this is based on a paper that we've published in late summer, uh, like last year. Uh, and uh, we had to make a selection, a careful selection here of like myths and legends and narratives that we actually present to you because we cannot present all of them. It's just too many of them. Um, so I made a very small selection. So two of them um, just to basically set the scene and to give you kind of like a flavor of what we actually mean by these narratives and how they play out. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously the more kind of like background and reflection with the literature and, and the research um, that we did on this. I also should say that um, this is very conceptual in the sense that we've looked at, um, and this is maybe where this is like historical research as such, We've obviously looked at the past. No? Um, we have a modern example as well, just to prove our point, basically. But there's very little research into this. Um, and this was one of the reasons why we said we want to write this paper and we want to do this to say, OK, there is actually much more to it and there should be more research into these issues. Um, OK, so let's start. So this is a part of a poem by Heinrich Heine, who's uh, a German poet. Um, outside of Germany, he's mostly known because his so called leader, so songs have been um, set to music by Schubert and uh, Schumann. Um, but he's a well known, or he was a well known like journalist and author uh, in Germany. And fun fact of the day uh, Karl Marx was his third cousin. Um, <laughs> So uh, he's often seen, though he falls into the period of Romanticism, he's actually seen as the one who overcame Romanticism in Germany. Um, I'm going to read it out in German, and you can follow on the right-hand side um, with the English one. Ne? And uh, das Seegespenst, ne? that basically uh, the sea ghost, no, not monster, but the sea ghost, and it's from 1827. <clears throat> Ich aber lag am Rand des Schiffes und schaute träumenden Auges hinab in das spiegelklare Wasser und schaute tiefer und tiefer, bis tiefe Meeresgrunde anfangs wie dämmernde Nebel, jedoch allmählich farbenbestimmter Kirchenkuppel und Türme sich zeigten und endlich sonnenklar eine ganze Stadt. When we return to what this means, um, he was influenced um, while traveling um, to the North Sea and he's referring to one of the most common 
uh, legends associated with the North Sea, um, which is the sunken city of uh, Wunghold, and we come back to this later. But let's start at the very beginning. Um, so the reason why we were interested in, in, in this type of research is um, because often we thought that we're too focused on like abstract like scientific knowledge and that it would solve all the world's problems if only would people would listen to science and, and research. Mm -hmm. But there is, of course, knowledge beyond scientific uh, like knowledge. There are stories, myths, legends, narratives, and they can play an important role in how people behave and react to natural disasters and environmental changes. Mm -hmm. So this research is about how we can tap into this knowledge and use it you know, to adapt to climate change, for example. You know? So we could see it as a kind of like an act of co-creating future knowledge. You know? So not just one type of knowledge, but integrating different types of knowledge. And the underlying research questions that we had were, so how do existing historic narratives influence people's perception of urgent environmental problems? Um, how do regional collective identities and knowledge shape the perception of climate change? Um, the third one, how do identities influence the adaptive capacity to climate change, especially when adaptation measures contradict existing narratives and set perceptions? And then finally, how can stories and local historic knowledge allow a better understanding of mental barriers against adaptation measures um, and may give researchers new resources to communicate necessary actions you know, to regional communities and decision makers. I should stress that we focused on group identity, on regional identity, not on individual identity. There's a lot of stuff like in, in the literature on individual perception of climate change, individual identities, uh, where you are on the political spectrum, etc., about influence and how this influences your approach to climate change. This is about group identity. So um, let's go a little bit deeper into what we call um, or what we call like regional identity. Of course, both words are very controversial. Um, if I would ask you to define region, and we are in a, in a geography department, I would get one, two, three, four, twenty different uh, definitions because there is no definition for, for region. No? There simply isn't. Uh, you can just make one up basically no? and you and and this is how it how it actually happens in, in in most cases like if you look at political borders and administration borders if you look into the history it's just obviously there are made up regions um and the same obviously is true with identity no? um, it's a very fuzzy term what it actually means so but in the context here and in the context of nation building processes this, um, historic research has determined how an alleged like joint history created a collective national identity. Remember, the nation states as we know them today are very young. We're talking 19th century here, mm -hmm. um, uh, especially in continental Europe, mm -hmm. Europe uh, um, Germany, France, etc. Mm -hmm. so these are very young nations actually, uh, and often this was accompanied by the creation of like myths and legends. Um, in France, for example, the whole thing of like Joan of Arc, you know, creating um, like that umbrella um, for, for France. You know? And to, even today, interesting enough, the kind of like legend around Joan of Arc is, left, is used by the left and the right of the political spectrum. You know? um, the same is true for Germany, where you have uh, where you had a king called Barbarossa, so the red bearded king, and he's buried in a mountain in the middle of Germany. And the saying is that if he awakes again, then the German Empire will rise. Um, and then in the 19th century, this was used um, when, after the French German War in 1870, 1871, uh, Germany, as we know it, more or less as we know it today, emerged um, from this. Uh, and the first um, King or, or not Emperor of Germany, then William the First. Um, he had a white beard, so he wasn't Barbarossa, but Barbar Blank, you know, so the white beard king, and they stylized him as kind of like the savior of the and creator of the German nation. You know? So um, think of the Magna Carta you know, here in the UK and, and uh, as a kind of like joint myth uh, 
and how it's used and how it was used in, in COVID times as well. Now people claim, ah, there's a paragraph in the Magna Carta that allows me that I don't have to stick to it, lockdown rules, blah, 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 and so on. Um, and so this was on the like national level, um, but obviously this happened on a region level as well. And again, you have to remember, so all of these nations uh, or most of the European nations are fairly young as we know them, or in the borders as we know them today. And there's a similar phenomenon, obviously, what was before. So before we had all these little kind of like kingdoms, earldoms, dukedoms, and so on and so on. And uh, to some extent, they still exist today. Some of them like cross what are now national borders. Um, and we still have these regions all over Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is, I think, one of the like takeaway messages here is that often like political or administrative borders do not align with like cultural borders. So, uh, they are, they cross simply cross borders. Um, I mean, one of the um, regions in France that has been really badly badly treated by by history is Alsace, no? so in the north uh, east of France. No? I mean, German, French, German, French, no? um, and that's when we're talking maybe. 40 years ago, um, and it changed. No? Um, you had grandfathers fighting, uh, for, yeah, fighting for, wait, I always need to get this right, for, for sorry, yeah, for France in the First World War. No, sorry, for France, um, no, for Germany in the First World War, and then their sons for, uh, for France in the Second World War, no, because it changed. No? Um, so this is, no, this doesn't really align. Um, and these exist, um, and, and within these regional contexts, we of course have like historic, like existing historic narratives that can help and shape like a collective identity and create a feeling of belonging uh, and, and kind of like a close knit group. Culture is a marker, language or dialect, uh, obviously, is a close marker. Uh, and again, they cross boundaries, uh, they cross borders. Um, then um, and interesting enough, we see this whole kind of like political identity issue plays out if you look at all the populist movements of, of today. Mm -hmm. um, they just, they try to tap into people's identities. Mm -hmm. What does it mean being English? What does it mean being French? We will see that this year's French presidential campaign is drenched in identity politics. Mm -hmm. Who is French and so on. Mm -hmm. um, Vox in, in Spain. Their election campaign is based on like Spain or the Spaniards. Hmm? It's all about identity here. Hmm? Um, so, um, um, no identities, no ref um, and, and identities uh, and regional identities. They are reflected like in literature, in art, uh, and in oral traditions. No? So, for example, the German word Sage, which is legend in English, just means basically to tell. No? Sagen is the German verb for, um, for to tell, because often predating like written sources, they were just passed on orally no? um, to us. Um, so what defines an identity? And how do we even determine a region? No? These are difficult questions. No? especially since the definition varies when looking at various like administrative levels um, that set like different kind of like regional boundaries. Uh, I mean, the European Union is interesting here as well, because one of the most powerful like instruments and um, within the European Union is the, the Council of Regions. And then they form these cross-border regions, which cross like national borders, but often they have been formed because they align with like cultural borders. Right? because we have redrawn the borders in, in Europe so often huh, in, in the past. Okay, um, here's another example. So this is from uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, which is probably, yeah, compared to Shakespeare, compared to Cervantes. Um, so this is the big guy uh, in terms of like, literature. He was a poet, a writer, uh, a dramatist. Uh, he was a polymath. Uh, he, he was influential in his like, uh, um, theory of colors, etc. No? So really like uh, amazing. Um, this is from the second part of his kind of like, seminal work, like Faust. Um, so Faust is like for the English speakers, that's Christopher Marlowe here, no Dr. Faust. It's the uh, it's the same story, no? like selling your, your soul to the devil, etc. What do you get in return? No? It's kind of like these big themes. 
So this is from the second part. Uh, and again, I'm going to read it out uh, and then focus a little bit on the parts that are highlighted in red. No? So Faust in a character says, no? a swamp lies there below the hill, infecting everything I've done. My last and greatest act of will succeeds when that foul pool is gone. Let me make room for many a million, wholly secure but free to work on. Green fertile fields where men and herds may gain swift comfort from the new made earth. Quickly settled in those hills embraced, piled high by a brave industrious race. And in the center here, a paradise whose boundaries hold back the raging time. And though it gnaws to enter in by force, the common urge unites to hold its cause. Yes, I've surrendered to this thought's insistence. The last word wisdom ever has to say, he only earns his freedom and existence who's forced to win them freshly every day. Childhood, manhood, ages, vigorous years, surrounded by dangers they spent here. I wish to gaze again on such a land, free earth where free race and freedom stand. Then to the moment I dare say, stay a while you are so lovely, through aeons, then never to fade away. This path of mine, through all that's earthly, anticipating here its deep enjoyment, now I savor it at that highest moment. Um, so in a nutshell, what this little scene describes is the human fight against water and the daily struggle for conquering nature is here described as the moment of greatest life. What he's describing actually is, and I'm kind of like filtering here, um, or making way for, for the example I will use because I focus on the, the North Sea region. Uh, and this is what, what he describes, um, because this was a region that was flooded every six hours right, when the tide came in. So it was uninhabited. You couldn't, or some people live there, as I will explain. But people started building dikes. So they made something incredible um, because usually land is a very scarce resource. And here they were able to build vast amounts of it and they could use it for pastures they could use it to grow crops etc etc no and this is what he describes here you know? and he sees it as that like uh, the moment kind of like of, of greatest luck no um of this new kind of like because it also yeah. now as populations were growing around europe you, you needed space for people to settle and this offered space no? people could go um so this is from uh, 1832 yeah, just to remember. Let's take a little closer look um, at these narratives in the North Sea region. There are a couple of them, um, so I highlight um, some of them, and you'll see some similarities already. And one of the things we realized, um, because we looked at the whole North Sea region, so Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, a little bit France as well, but then also here, the, the east coast of the UK, but we also looked at the Baltic Sea. We did, in the paper, we actually did look beyond Europe uh, or beyond northern Europe, and, we, and there are some examples from, um, from Southeast Asia as well, because obviously this is not just a phenomenon, these narratives uh, of northern Europe. So one of the narratives that we frequently find is that this kind of like constant threat of the sea has created a special kind of people. Um, and the stories and legends they created are constant reminders of that threat. Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned uh, Rumholt before, no? which is the, no, is, no, oops, over here, which is this like mythical place, uh, like the, the sunken city um, where sometimes you can, on certain days, usually it's Easter, where you see the religious connection, you can still hear the church bells of that city kind of like ringing. And often the story or the narrative that goes with it is that um, the local people, like they lived in um, splendor, they, were, they became rich, their lives became sinful, and so they started drinking, they started um, neglecting the dike because you know, these dikes were precious and protecting you from the sea and you needed to constantly upkeep them you know, and make sure you needed always someone who watches the dike so that the water that comes in every six hours, or if there's a storm flood, it doesn't break the dike. No? So here, no? and this is the kind of like common story, they lived like the, the sinful life, uh, they got drunk, they uh, did not really care, and then basically, whoops, with one storm flood, 
the whole city was destroyed and that sunk into the ocean. And the interesting thing is we, we find this all across a similar story all across the North Sea. So this is um, yeah, Ungholt is like it's it's on the North Frisian coast, so that's like close to Denmark. Uh, the other one, other one, Vineta, uh, that's actually in the Baltic Sea. There's Paris, uh, which is in France, and there's the city in Suffolk, Dunwich, um, Dunwich. Anyway, uh, and you always find that, like, the same pattern. Uh, um, that's that's repeated. Um, then another one is that. Um, Building the dike is usually seen as a sign of like virtue and a godly life, no? versus the, and I mentioned this before, the sinful kind of like boisterous and neglectful lifestyle that leads to neglect of the dike no? and, and so on, and the gods and like storm flood. No? Um, so the whole idea of like building these dikes is a very positive connection, uh, uh, sorry, connotation. No? Um, so this is all seen as a kind of like progressive like movement. No? So from, and we're talking about the time frame of over a thousand years ago. So they started building like very simple dikes like over a thousand years ago. And then gradually, obviously, with technology this evolved. And, and I'll show you um, a picture in a moment how it looks today, um, how sophisticated they are. Um, yeah. Oops. yeah. And then, but living in these areas, as such, there's nothing new. Um, I'm just going to jump to the next one because you can see actually what I'm talking about. So what are the areas? So you see, so this is the northwestern part of Germany. Berlin is here. Hamburg is here. Uh, just as a reference, but here. So it's this kind of like peninsula. So this area um, used to be flooded like every six hours. No? It was impossible to live there, except for a few places because in the kind of like uh, the landscape, well, it's kind of like flat. You have these kind of like natural hills, but they're very small. And you can fit maybe like one house on top of it. Um, and then people had a couple of cows or, or, or other animals, but then every six hours, the water came in and then the water level is somewhere here. Right? So you so you always needed to um, so you always needed to make sure um, to bring uh, like to uh, to make sure your your, your animals and obviously your um, your family is safe. Um, so at one point they started like draining the land right, to make it to create more land right, and, and the whole area. And today it's like a network of thousands of like small canals and ditches etc um, and then you have these inlets which open with gravity every six hours letting the water in and then it's channeled um, and then obviously after six hours the the water needs to go back into the ocean but since you have a dike you need pumping stations huh? um, or what they use in, in the past windmills huh? so these beautiful windmills we know from mostly from the Netherlands well, they look nice, but this primary function is to pump water over the dike. Mm -hmm. um, and I will come back to what the issue here is with climate change um, towards the end. But let me go back. Um, so, so the the thing with the dike building is that the the people have are very proud of this, mm -hmm. um, and this defines their identity. Mm -hmm. So we've always been basically stormproof because we built these dikes. We upkeep them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so when you talk to them now um, about climate change, climate change adaptation, where the actual problem isn't so much like sea. Well, obviously it is a problem like sea level rise and storm floods, but they are well protected because they have the dike, and in some instances the dikes are now nine meters high. Mm -hmm. The problem is inland flooding and the kind of like uh, occurrence of both. You know? So the storm flood is coming in from the sea. At the same time, we have rain uh, or precipitation inland, and then obviously water gets stuck you know, because you can't pump it over because your water level is, is already high. Um, so that's the real danger. But 
and this is like from my own experience in the area and talking uh, to stakeholders, this is the story they don't want to hear because they identify themselves as, nope, we're protected against it. It's storm floods and nothing else. Don't you worry. Mm -hmm. um, because if you make suggestions like um, retreating what's called behind like the second dike line or opening the dike at certain points to let water in, um, it, it's seen as a step backwards no? because the story or the narrative of, has always been we build a dike and that will protect us. Um, and if it's not high enough, well, we make it higher. No? Um, so that's the negative kind of like consequence. But there's also a positive side to it, um, which is that these storm narratives um, create some form of like collective and living memory. The example here is, and this is under number four, um, the, the storm flood in Hamburg uh, in 1962, which came a little bit as a surprise, to say the least, to the people of Hamburg in 1962, it killed hundreds of people. Um, the then mayor of Hamburg later became uh, chancellor of Germany, Helmut Schmidt, in the 1980s. Uh, but that's just as an aside. But it's it's still, I mean, this is now it's it's a long time ago, but this is still in people's memories. But again, what the historical research on environmental disasters tells us that if it is within living memory of people, you you can create collective memory and people will remember it. But if there hasn't been uh, a natural disaster for decades, people will just forget about it. You know, they start building in flat phone areas, etc. Et you know? um, okay, let me jump to this again, um, um, to the example. So I've introduced the area already. Um, so this is the northwest of Germany, um, not very densely populated, to be honest, very kind of like flat. Um, dairy farming. Um, you find lots of um, wind mills or wind turbines uh, now onshore, offshore, and near shore. Uh, tourism obviously uh, is going on heavily in the area. We don't really have beaches uh, in this. No, no, there are no sandy beaches because it's all about protection. No? It looks very technocratic. Um, I'll show you a photo here. So this is how this is how the dive looks like. No? Um, so you have the sea side here, um, and then this is the land. Um, and then speaking of like memories and how to remember and how to build up collective memories so on the right hand side, what you see here, these are flood markers on houses and you find them in, in all of these places, like in, in the villages as well as in the towns. So this will tell you that on the 13th of November of 1872, this was how high the water actually was. No? Or here, um, I mean, you probably can't read it, but even as an English speaker, you can read this because the funny thing, of course, is that the dialect people speak is very close to English because this is where the English language came from. Um, so this was the, the water level in 1625. Yeah. Um, and, you, and you find them everywhere, kind of like, just to remind people of. Uh, the power uh, or the force that water actually has as well. Um, so as I said at the very beginning, um, we haven't actually found much research into this in modern times. Um, the, the one study we found though, um, what's like, and this is not almost like five years ago, uh, a study on collaborative landscape planning or on a collaborative landscape planning process to support decision-making. Um, so this was on ecosystem services, um, and um, she's actually um, the main author. She's a former colleague of mine, um, the place where I did my PhD. And they work with stakeholders in the area. Um, I think just to go back to show you, I think it was to be kind of like very in, kind of like in this corner here. Um, so they work with different like stakeholders. Um, and the interesting thing here is that uh, which of the four scenarios the stakeholders actually opted for, um, and this is interesting for the whole debate about like regional identity. Um, so they opted for what was called like an actor-based scenario, which is B, so the um, top, uh, bottom right corner, 
um, which includes so called like polder areas and widening and strengthening um, of the main drainage system to prevent flooding and increase water retention. Um, but here, and this is important, no? it was important to all stakeholders to maintain the landscape's aesthetic value and that cultural services, among them community identification, were seen as essential. No? So they were open partially to new ideas, um, but it was also very important kind of like to um, preserve a little bit the status quo. The interesting idea is, uh, what I found interesting is the aesthetic value of the land, because obviously none of this is nature, all of this is cultural land, you know? all of this was created. You know? So um, while usually the people are very kind of like stubborn, and this is what they're known for in this area, um, here you could see that change is possible no? if you um, take some key components kind of like off the regional identity into how they you respect it. Um, which leads me to the integration of local knowledge. Um, and I think this is crucial here um, because this is often like linked to like um, uh, regional identities. Right? Um, so in this area, people often have a very kind of like proud sense of what they constitute like a mild breeze where someone who doesn't live near the coast would say, oh my God, this is a storm. Uh, but for them, it's just like, huh? um, or what really constitutes a storm flood. Um, in this sense, like local knowledge can be a corrective for abstract, like formal knowledge, no? positively and negatively. No? And using or, uh, local knowledge to understand like risks, landscapes, and traditions, um, and potential enablers and barriers. No? Um, for example, I remember we, we did a uh, summer school in the area probably like 10 years ago. We had students from, from Germany and students from Tanzania and from South Africa, and we put them into different groups and they were, they did a similar exercise as my colleagues. Um, and it clearly showed because most of the German students were from the area and their solution in terms of like climate change adaptation were actually more or less what we find in the adaptation plans for the area. So increase the height of the dike, um, uh, more storm uh, and flood protection, blah, 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 and so on and so on. But the, the students from um, Tanzania and South Africa who were not familiar with the area uh, at all, their solution was retreat. They said, we just need to leave the area. Why do you spend so much money on all of these measures? Why don't you just leave the area no, and you, you give it up? Right? Um, and then, just lastly, like traditional knowledge in the global north, I, I just like to make kind of like the point that often in the discussion, and you find this in the, in the literature, when we talk about like traditional knowledge, it's often associated with the global south. But obviously, we have traditional knowledge here in the global north as well. I think there's a little bit of a misconception because we are so technologically kind of like advanced and we have outsourced lots of these things to like professional bodies. No, we don't. I don't, as a private person, I don't have to take care of like uh, flood protection. No? I pay my taxes, so that's someone else does this, etc. No? But obviously, there is a lot of like local knowledge available. No? Okay, just uh, second last slide, basically. Um, so, um, the, with regard to like climate change adaptation in the area, the current policy is still hold the line. No? So. Um, what they're currently doing is um, they're upgrading the dike. Um, they gave it kind of like a climate change top up, which I think is like one meter. But in this federal state of Germany alone, we, we are talking about 700 kilometers of dike. Um, and it's 1 million euros per kilometer. So because it's, it's the, oops, is it here? Oh, no. Because this may look kind of like, Simple, no? but it's no, this is as I said, it, it's up to nine meters high, no? and it takes up a lot of space. No? So it's it's not easy. Um, you find lots of sheep, and sheep are actually the cheapest sorry, uh, means of protecting a dike. Because what are sheep doing the whole day like this? And this is actually perfect for the um, for the dike because you're. Uh, yeah, kind of like for, uh, for, for the soil. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, and this is just this. Uh, yeah, so in uh, and, and this goes back to my own research on climate change adaptation in the area. When we talked to stakeholders and we suggested like options such as retreat or opening the dikes or living with water, you're not taken seriously. Right? It's just like it just goes against the grain. Basically, right? it's just like no, don't worry. Uh, we have the dike. We have protectors. Um, yeah, yeah, we will deal with it in that problem. You know? So it's like you, you're not getting anywhere um, with the people at the coast um, if you come with like, like fancy measures um, that you've come up with maybe from like international literature. So, so um, but I think the example has shown it is possible right, if you take into account some of the like regional identities. And this is just like a reminder of what is actually happening in the area and, and um, the story or the narrative that people don't want to hear um, because there are two things happening. Um, so this is the dike, this is land, this is the seaside. So we have two, there's sea level rise, there's so-called secular sea level rise resulting from the last ice age, and then there's anthropogenic sea level rise. So sea level is rising at the same time. Here the land is actually subsiding because we're constantly draining it every six hours when we get the water. So this goes down, this goes up, meaning the water that's here is pumped over the dike. And what do you need for pumping? You need electricity. And who's going to pay for that electricity? Where are you going to get that electricity from? That's the, the key issue here. Um, but that's very hard to get into people's heads. Um, but this is the actual problem. Um, and it's because the, um, what I said before, because it's the, the dike is seen as a kind of a cultural achievement. You know? And like, if you tell them you need to find uh, like other uh, measures, other options, it's just like um, seen as a cultural kind of like step backwards um, for them. Okay, let me quickly conclude. Um, yeah, so in the context of climate change and um, connected extreme weather events, recognizing these regional stories may, only, may not only give a better understanding of mentalities or identities, it can also be a tool to explain and justify certain measures. And myths, legends, and narratives can, yeah, in a regional context, be an asset as well as a barrier for climate change adaptation, and therefore often interesting new research perspective. Yeah. And climate change adaptation can tap into these myths, narratives, and stories. And before I close, I read an interesting article over the weekend on like, anti-vaccination movements. And here you can basically, if you uh, exchange like virus um, and vaccines with climate change, you know, so you know, they call it the ecology of rumors. You know, um, the under so understanding the contagion of not just viruses, but also sentiments and beliefs is crucial to the future of vaccines. Yeah. So if you exchange it, climate change, I think there's some truth in it. And with this, I'd like to close. Um, oops, here are our email addresses and questions. As I said, Jessica's also happy to answer some questions. As I said, she's much better on the whole kind of like historical background uh, and these questions. Okay, thank you.